Hi, I'm Jeremy Robinson, and this is the 19th hole. Hi, and welcome to episode eight of the 19th hole podcast. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a couple of good mates of mine. First of all, Stuart Manley. Manners, you and I go back a long time. You're the first signing we had for Black Star Golf. So I'm honoured that you've actually come on the uh, on the show. But more honoured, I've got to say, your long-standing coach, Neil Matthews, who is also, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, you are the head golf coach of the Welsh Golf Union. No, that's correct. Yeah, no, that's correct. Or yes, that's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Oh, that's correct. <laughs> and also a collector of yardage books, I might add. I love a yardage book, Jeremy. Oh, I know you do. We know that. <laughs> so anyway, so thanks a lot for coming on, guys. And uh, thanks, for, for, thanks for joining the show. Stu, as I mentioned, you, you've been with Blackstar. You were actually a, a, just about the first signing. I remember watching you in the uh, Walker Cup at Ganton in 2003. Is that correct? That's right, mate. You actually, uh, you actually came down to my house in Aberdeen a couple of months after that, didn't you? I think I did. Yeah, two thousand and three, mate. That's a long time ago, and that was the first Walker Cup that I'd been to since. In the background here, nineteen eighty-seven at Sunningdale. Oh, showing your age there, mate. Yeah, I know. But the one thing is that there's a common denominator here, and the two people on the top of the podcast, the Walker Cup players, the one on the bottom, unfortunately, isn't. But we'll, we'll, you know, that's good. We're glad your coach is here, anyway. <laughs> Well, what do they say if you can't if you can't play? What's the saying? Well, go on, say it. Can't play. You turn to coach, isn't it? Yeah. Like so, uh, anyway, so yeah, so I remember watching you with with, uh, with a fellow Welshman playing the playing at the at Ganton in the Walker Cup in two thousand and three. Nigel yeah. Edwards, who's now a converted Englishman, but anyway, that's beside the point. But I, I do remember that Ganton, great venue. In fact, funny enough, as I said to you previous. I'm playing there in a couple of weeks' time, as my brother's still a member there. But what, what's your kind of uh, recollections? I know it's a long time ago, but great honour to play in the Walker Cup. For me personally, I'm getting to, you know, I'm beyond finished now, and but it's nice to look back on it. How about yourself? Yeah, mate, it was awesome. Like, uh, just such a good experience. Just to play in front of crowds. I've never seen crowds. like that. I think there were like 14,000 people watching each day. And I just, I just remember I really, really struggled uh, before that first tee shot, that you know that, that hour leading up to the first tee time, I just remember like I was so so scared, you know, really really nervous. And even my parents came up to me and said, "Look, are you okay? You look really white." And I was like, "I'm just uh, just feeling a little bit uh, on edge here, you know." Um, but after that first tee shot, obviously I got one away. The crowd uh, applauded, and then after that, um, we played some good golf and actually won some, won some games with Nigel, which was really good. And uh, I think it was good playing with Nigel. Obviously, he played a couple of water cups before that, and um, he kind of calmed me down and said, "Look, you know, just try your best and go out there." And uh, we we gelled nicely. When when it's interesting, you say like scared. I mean, obviously scared, not in a bad way, in a good way. Nervous, etc. Would you say you were more nervous then than you were when you played in your foot in the first major? Very, very similar. Very similar. It's hard. obviously playing in the Open a couple of years ago. I can remember obviously very vividly. Um, those nerves were really, really bad as well. Obviously, I'd just seen the group in front of me, the first group at 6.30 a.m., it was Marco, Mira, and a couple of the guys. They'd hit it out of bounds. Then my playing partner teed up and shanked it out of bounds. <laughs> and I was thinking, I had a 6.40 tee time. And I was thinking, oh, what a great tee time on a Lynx golf course. Get out there, post a good score. There won't be many people in the crowd. You know, the stand behind me be empty. I get on the tee. It's into the wind, freezing cold, hammering down with rain. And the stand behind me was packed. And I was like, whoa, this is just different level I was I was petrified I actually said to my caddy we planned to hit a three went off the tee and I said look just give me the iron and to be fair to Mike at the time he said no 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 you're not having it hit the three when I just about made contact off the toe and I hit it so poorly towards the out of bounds it didn't actually reach so I I managed to scramble a five and after that obviously played great but uh, yeah them first tee shot ones um, they're never nice no, I remember, uh, well, I remember being with you, Neil. It was a bit chilly that morning, wasn't it? Oh, the weather was terrible, wasn't it? I think it was sort of uh, obviously early in the morning, but uh, 
it uh, th that weather for the first sort of hour and a half was was cold, wet, um, windy. It was kind of I think it was into out the left, wasn't it? On the first, of oh, the night, terrible, but yeah, one of the hardest sort of opening tee shots as well, isn't it? And you've uh, you've got the wind in that direction. And uh, was it Maverick um, Maverick McNeely? Maverick yeah. McNeely, yeah, he just, yeah, he, yeah. He just shanked it straight in front of me, uh, straight OB, and I was like, and the crowd, obviously, with the crowd, like. Give it the big ooh, you know. I'm like, oh, geez, didn't need to see that, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and then it's probably one of the hardest tee shots as well. I, I, I would like, not that I've played any more majors, but like, it's the hardest shot, hardest tee shot on the golf course, I think, you know. And uh, that to be your first one as well, it's just, and your first major just wasn't nice. Mm -hmm. But a great experience overall. I mean, I remember my first major, my, my legs were shaking, I could hardly move. But you know, you look back at it, and it's, you know, it's a great thing to have done, isn't it? Oh, mate, it was awesome. I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Obviously, it wasn't the week I... Um, I didn't play that well after that. Obviously, the second round wasn't great. But, like, just the whole experience, the, the circus of it, like, the how big it was. You know, I just I just didn't expect how big that major would be, um, obviously, until I played it. And then after, even after the round, like I said to you guys, I'll see you in a couple of minutes. But it was, like, over an hour before I finished the, the media... Uh, responsibilities and then, then um, I got drug tested so they probably thought oh, he's had a good score we better drug test him and uh, <laughs> it was like almost an hour and a half before I saw you guys and my family before we could go and lunch and talk about it you know? yeah so hopefully there'll be more majors but I, I do remember I mean we'll, we'll come back to it but I know the second day didn't go as you was hoping but what a finish to the uh, the first round wasn't it oh it was awesome mate. to hold that bunker shot um, and then to hold I don't know, what was it, 40 foot on the last in front of a, a decent crowd on the 18th and my friends and family who had made the journey up. Uh, it was pretty special, obviously. I'll, uh, I'll cherish that for the rest of my life. Yeah, I, well, I, deservedly so as well. So um, when did you get, what, so what, what year actually did you turn pro manners? Uh, 2003, straight after Gunton. Straight after Gunton, that's what I thought, yeah. So when did yeah. you guys actually start? Have you, did you know each other before then? And were you working together at that time or not? Um, not at all, no. We, we we grew up playing, obviously, boys golf together. And uh, obviously, Neil saw me coming through and he thought, well, I better turn pro quickly here because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make much money against Manners here. But uh, no, obviously, Neil, Neil, Neil was good. I'll give him some credit, actually. He was probably, well, he was the best Welsh boy at the time and probably one of the best in GB and I. Obviously, he played for GB and I. Um, and was miles ahead of me and the rest of the boys. Uh, he was just so much more professional at the time. Um, then he decided to turn pro, Neil, didn't you? Quite early, I think you were 19. And then I, I didn't see you for us for several years then, did I? No, I think you come on a squad trip in, I, I can't remember the year now, Jeremy, but probably maybe 08, 09 or something like that. And, um, and I, I was national coach at that time, so... Uh, yourself and Phil came on a squad squad week, I think, didn't yeah, you? Uh, yeah, yeah. We played with our sort of amateur men's international squad, and uh, we we just did a little bit of work there, I think. And it just uh, maybe the following year, I think we we started uh, working full time together. Just going back though, Neil. So you, are, what, when did you turn pro? What uh, what year did you turn pro? The, the end of '99, I turned pro. Right, and you obviously turned pro, hoping to to. Do, I mean, you turned pro to play the game. Yeah, I guess like. <sighs> Like I Stu said, I, I'd, I'd um, played for GBNI boys team in Wales at every level, but you know, like uh, ultimately, um, I think we all have a dream of of playing on tour, winning on tour. Uh, I probably turned pro definitely, like you know, made a really poor choice, turned pro too early, where I could have kind of gone what you guys did and went to America, and that probably would have been a better option in one sense, but then. Um, I just I wanted a qualification behind myself and thought I'll do the PGA and and play and and after that come back to to compete. Well, anybody that kind of does the PGA probably understands that you're in the shop back in those days for sixty hours a week and that yeah. that unfortunate it was a really poor poor choice and and probably put the the nail in the coffin of any career playing. But to be honest, look, um, I didn't really feel I was good enough and didn't have the the sort of belief and probably at the time didn't realize that you could perhaps change some of the areas that you could change technically. Mm. I just wasn't a particularly great hitter. <clears throat> I thought, well, that's, that, that's the end of that. And, um, uh, and probably kind of fueled a bit of the coaching stuff. And, and I guess I wouldn't be as far along in the coaching 
if I if I hadn't have done the PGA and and decided to to put my sort of emphasis on that. But um, yeah, you know, like almost one bad choice, but it kind of has ended up being being reasonable for a career in the other end. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I've had like David Ledbetter on in on a previous one and on a different kind of side, Gareth Lord, who was a caddy but a pro as well. Both of them kind of said, you know, early on when they turned pro, they realised that. Uh, playing and they weren't going to do it and they kind of lordy funny enough was coaching in germany at the time but led better certainly because he grew up in nick price etc he was saying started studying the game a bit more so really same kind of thing for you do you think a bit without question and, and like you know it's bizarre because like i i probably is a, is a negative way to look at it but i've beaten some really quite good players but I, you know when you play with them and you think oh, i've been really lucky to to win a match mm. there and I almost thought well I was more probably more interested now in they played the game than how I played it and and um you know so there, there was some some probably quite quite good triggers for me actually when I look back on it to think well you probably weren't gonna 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 do that and um and yeah I, I was just interested in how other people played how um you know some of perhaps some of the as I started coaching some of the mistakes that I made or some of the the issues that I had within my own game, I was interested in that initially, and then just become more fascinated with what some of the better players did and uh, how I could, you know, help other people to kind of uh, develop their golf. And, and it just kind of, even from very early in coaching, turning pro in the first year, I, I'd kind of helped a couple of players get from a four handicap to scratch, then scratch to plus four and thought, well, I, I kind of, you know, quite like this. And, yeah, and I was going to say, it's like, it must give you a lot of pleasure in seeing, you know, not just teaching pros, but when you first, obviously now you'd probably prefer to teach pros, but when you first started making, you know, seeing amateurs improve. Without question, you know, and I've got to say, like, it doesn't really matter. If somebody's really keen to develop their game, you know, you, you, you want to help them and, yeah. and be part of it. And obviously uh, it's great when, it, when, when you work with somebody for some time and Stu's had some fantastic results, uh, so whilst, whilst we've been working together and it's, it's great to see somebody that puts a lot of effort in and you work and you form a partnership with and for them to succeed mm. so you guys clearly from me looking from the outside in you know you, you say about 2009 but you know you have formed a partnership you've been do, doing it together for a long time you know and uh Manners, you better get a word in edge, edgeways here, otherwise you can leave, to be honest. But um, <laughs> when when you kind of went to Spain in 2009, when you say with Phil, with Pricey, do you mean Phil Price? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so when you went there, did you have a coach at the time, Manners, or not? Yeah, I think I was with Pete Cowan, actually. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so pretty world-renowned coach at the time, probably the biggest in Europe, I would say. Um. And I just felt I needed maybe somebody closer to home, although Pete was obviously very handy um, being on tour. So I thought I was kind of stuck in between the two, you know what I mean? But uh, I like what Neil said to me that week and it kind of something stuck in my head. And I thought, well, I'd like to go back and see Neil. And after that, um, I was actually quite, I was struggling with my game at the time. And um, Neil showed me a few things on video in Portugal that week. And I thought, God, yeah, that actually, that's the first time I'd actually seen my swing properly in a long time. And I just thought, oh, that's, that's not good there, you know what I mean? So um started working with Neil that winter more so then and, um, made some good changes and I saw some improvements and I liked what he said. Yeah. And and man, um, sorry, Neil, when you when you first started uh, working with Manners, did you kind of look at his swing and think I I can help him, or did you kind of think, you know, maybe he's doing the right thing? Well, what were your first impressions? I mean, obviously you'd seen him play, etc. But when he came to Spain and when you obviously started talking more in de in detail about what you were trying to achieve. Did you think you could help him with certain things? Yeah, I think so. And, and you know, like Stu was a really good player. As you said, he's played played Walker Cup. Um, I think you were undefeated Walker Cup as well, weren't you? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah. As Ed's as, as kind of played on tour. But, you know, when in contention, he was struggling really with some some of the sort of basic mechanics that they would they would break down. Um, and, yeah, I, I think it, it was it was pretty clear from some of the patterns that he was talking about and some of the shots that he was hitting um what what sort of uh, he needed to do and i think 
as always, it's difficult, isn't it, when you're out and you're competing week in, week out, and it's easy to get yourself down a bit of a rabbit hole and you kind of lose sense of where you where you're at. And 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 we've always had a good relationship, even as amateurs. So I think it kind of um, it probably helped that uh, with Stu in particular that sort of that relationship and um, just just went from there really. Um, and in fairness, you know the 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 some of his ball striking and some of his even some of the short game stuffs improved uh, an awful lot over over the last couple of years. He's always been a real hard worker, but perhaps mm. not always put the work in in the right right areas. Yeah. So just just going back from from your own kind of coaching career, obviously head golf coach of the Welsh Golf Union. How did that come about then? Is that a you know a pretty pretty good thing to have really? Yeah, like I guess, I, and I would have been quite young. You know, I probably would have been twenty seven. Maybe I was going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, when I took over. Um, well, yeah, well, I, I, like in essence, I was coaching. I think that maybe the men's amateur champion or the boys amateur uh, boys champion, um, and quite a number of the boys or quite a number of internationals. And a job David Llewellyn was a national coach at the time, and they were re-advertising for for two national coaches. Um, and I just fancied uh, was something I wanted to do. To be honest, I wanted to to coach tournament pros, and I wanted to 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 be a national coach and work with our international team. So when the job came up, I I, I applied for it, even though I was quite uh, quite young and inexperienced at the time, but. I felt like I could do the job and uh, was fortunate enough to to get it. Nigel Edwards, as you mentioned, was then the the performance director for Wales, and uh, I was lucky enough to to work with Nigel and and get that role. And you know, for, well, 15, 16 years later, I'm still still haven't been sacked yet. So Can't you, believe it. Can't <laughs> believe that. <laughs> you you mentioned Nigel, so we all know Nigel and everything. And obviously, when you're working with him, it, it must have been great to be working with a. Uh, a legend of the amateur game, I suppose. Certainly, a legend in Wales, a Welsh amateur golf, and a great golfer himself. You know, is it uh, when he when he went on to be the England director of golf? Did it, things change a little bit or not? Yeah, like look, every um, like I've worked with three performance directors, and and every everyone has their own own take on thing, and everyone has their own own skill set. Um, I knew Nigel. I played in the same men's international team as him. So I knew of him and um, like he, he certainly looked after me in the first uh, first couple of years because, as you write, like I, I was young. So when I look back now, uh, you know, 27 and I've learned so much over the time of, of coaching, he certainly helped and, and uh, was really beneficial to have somebody with that experience whilst whilst starting. And um, yeah, it's just the kind of the role with Wales golf has changed a little bit over over time, but uh, still still really passionate about it and it'd be great to sort of uh, when you you have those sort of young players coming through and you see some of them playing Walker <clears> Cup and, and GBNI representation for a small country it's great to great yeah. to see. Mm. so just moving on so when when you're coaching you say working with Nigel and he was obviously some kind of probably a positive influence on you and you've been working with Manners for a long time I kind of asked the same question to David Ledbetter have who's kind of influenced you like Ledbetter said one or two of the players that he coached he obviously grew up with all the South Africans and the, and the Zimbabweans and they influenced him have you been has your method of coaching obviously it's changed with technology etc but have you been influenced by anybody oh hugely um like I think if 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 you're if you're coaching you don't learn from your players you've got a bit of a problem so when you're around good players and you start noticing what they do and and you you definitely well, you, you either won't work with them very long or you'll you'll learn to to manage and adapt and you learn probably as much from players as you do from from um, from as they learn from you like I certainly from from working with Phil and working from with Stu I learned a huge amount from both of them but um, yeah you know I think when when you 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 become somebody that kind of almost um, as a coach you initially think uh, you're terrified of it. And worried about messing people up and then as the time goes on then all of a sudden you think you're chocolate and you know it all mm. and you get through a point where you actually realize you don't know it all at all and that's absolutely fine um but learning off different pros learning off uh, how other people how other players do it learning off other coaches i think you know you you, you never really stop do you or oh, you hope you don't for sure Mm. Um, and you know, there's been a couple of people like Mark Ball. I've learned that was a biomechanist. I've learned an awful lot off off Mark and worked with him for a long time. And um, I, I guess I'm lucky that I can 
travel a little bit on tour and I've experienced some of that, but also there's a number of uh, really good coaches that network around that uh, are national coaches that you learn off and, and share ideas with, which is cool. So over the time, going back to your guys' relationship now, over the time you guys have been working, um, Manners, if you want to say something, you can. <laughs> so, I'm only kidding, Manners. I can't, you can't get a word in edgeways, can you, mate? I'll just come back in five minutes. Yeah, Coaches exactly. are paid to speak, Jeremy, yeah? <laughs> so over the, over the time, uh, has it been more kind of the scoring shots, the scoring clubs, short game, or have you trying to... Uh, improve your long game more would you say or is it a bit of both um mainly originally it was definitely long game for sure because it was really it really needed some help i actually always used to think actually i was really good with a short game area anyway my chipping and putting just naturally was good um i i needed it needed to be to be fair because my long game wasn't quite where it needed to be for tour stand and hence why i'd get my card lose my card get my card mm. and not have a prolonged um time on tour <clears throat> but yeah all the hitting for me um it's always it's always been that case i probably if i'm honest i never really had like good fundamentals from an early age um i, I was thinking i was one of those which just would practice and practice until i was like hitting it good but didn't know how i was hitting it good if you know what i mean it was kind of just more feel and then when I get under pressure, I get on big golf courses. Um, and, you know, I could get into contention, but then when the pressure was really on, I couldn't really kind of back myself with my technique, if you know what I mean. Um, but that, that was a bit of an eye opener then. Like when I did get into contention, I'd fall away and it'd be just a frustrating thing. So I thought I needed to kind of change technically, just be a little bit more technically sound. And I think even now these days, we're still trying to improve our long game technically. And we're probably actually trying to, um gain more speed these days um obviously with my age getting a little bit older 43 and obviously the young guys coming through and the way the golf courses are designed like our session today we had a two-hour session this morning and probably a good hour an hour and a half of that was speed training um and just getting ready obviously for the upcoming tournaments but um we are doing a little bit of putting a little bit of shocking you know I didn't. I originally didn't go to Neil for that, but actually, I've learned so much more with the chip inside of things as well. With Neil, I think my chipping now is, you know, before it was good, but again, it was just like really handsy. But now it's really technically good. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting how it's kind of it's going like full circle, you know. Um, but it's just everything. Like even every year, we we don't. I don't know. We everything is. I don't. We keep going forward, Jeremy. If you know what I mean. Um, just keep working on stuff how we can develop our game and get better and better and just stay stay on top of it. Mm. But for, from your point, Neil, when you're working with him and, and another player that, uh, you know, we both know, David Boot, who you've obviously been working with quite a long period of time. Fundamentally, you st is it pretty much working on the same things from your point of view, trying to improve the same areas? I mean, clearly, Booty, when he's on, I mean, I'm talking about when a player's playing well now, not when a player's struggling, but... Clearly, David Boot, or Booty as we know him, when his wedge game is on, it's as good as anybody's in the world, really, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. And I, like, I, I think you generally, as, a, as you're going to be really good, you need a bit of a superpower, don't you? you need something that is, that is exceptional. Um, so I guess, in answer to your question, is trying to figure out each player has a different way of, of playing the game, but... Um, it's understanding not, not just working on on those areas of improvement it's also understanding their strengths and how do you keep those strengths sharp so whilst manners has gradually uh, got better and better at hitting it he's also maintained if not improved some of those strengths like his putting inside of 20 feet in his short game is is exceptional mm. he still maintained that and i think it, it's really important as you make uh, like you're trying to make improvement because change can go both ways, can you? You can make a change and it can progress or you can regress. So I think if you can maintain the strengths um, for sure, and then you just keep one step at a time thinking about how you, you know, how that player is going to play the game, you know, Luke Donald and we played the game very differently to Dustin Johnson. So how, how is Manners going to play the game better? How is he going to score lower, which is ultimately the bottom line. Mm, because clearly, obviously from, you know, I'm a bit older than, uh, than you, Neil, only a little bit older than Manners. No way, no way. <laughs> but, but clearly coaching is, I mean, when I was when I was uh, taught to play the game, I was taught to hit the ball straight and worry about how far it went later. And now it's done a complete circle, hasn't it? 
now hit the ball for the young, like for, if you're coaching a group of 13, 14 year old kids who are good players in Wales, you're really coaching them to hit the ball, not as hard as they can, but create power and then bring it in later. It's definitely changed. Like I remember Sean, Sean Foley said something that I thought was excellent years and years ago. He said, uh, you know, you, um, you coach a world-class player and you teach kids. Yeah. And what he, what he meant by that is um, like the analogy I would use is you, 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 if golf's like almost to me, like playing poker. So you've got to learn to win with a hand you've been dealt, which is the scoring aspect that you guys are talking about. Although a Royal flush doesn't lose very often. So you're trying to build um, if you're building it from the ground up, you try and build it as good as you possibly can, which a lot of the information from all of you guys, really, like how you would have fed it to Manners, how Manners and Phil would have fed it to Manners, that is fed back down through all of our national squads. That wasn't available years ago, was it? You, you, you know, unless you were on tour or you coached on tour, how would you ever know? Whereas there's so much information, that's half the problem now, there's that much data and that much information, you've still got to figure out how it's useful to that individual, how are you going to use it? But but yeah, for sure, the, the golf courses in particular and equipment has changed massively, hasn't it? I know the objective of the game to get it in, in the hole and the fewer shots is, is still the same, but the way in which kids are developed and like, you know, we didn't have any S&C coaching at all, did we, back in the, that was not the... The way things were were done. No, we, we didn't have any of that. We barely had well, we had a nutritionist, I think, maybe come in once or twice, and a psychologist, but it was no strength and conditioning. But you just go, you go out on tour now, you've got on a challenge tour in particular. The lads obviously they're around 21 to 25, and they are you know proper athletes, really strong guys, could lift a lot of weight in the gym and are technically really good. So that recipe there, they're just going to send the ball 300 plus through the air. And you see that every week and hitting it 300 through the air. Now it's a common thing on the challenge though. It's it used to be back in the day because you'd say, oh, wow, what a hitter that guy is. But it's like so many guys are like that now, you know? Yeah, I mean, golfers are more, they're more athletes and than and, and golfers, aren't they? Or sportsmen, really. They're, they're true athletes, as you rightly say, the younger ones, aren't they? Yeah, but like I just I just don't like the way some of the, the golf course design is going though, you know. Uh you see the feedback the last couple of weeks from the European tour, you know, and they had thick, rough, firm greens courses. I'm not overly long, but they just set up great. Uh I just hopefully they can maintain that more often instead of just building a huge, huge golf course in, in a field, basically, you know. Um I, I, for me, it's not the way I'd want to play golf, just standing there and bombing it, go find it. It's just nice to have strategy. It's nice to play tight golf courses, be rewarded for accuracy. Um, and I just hopefully, hopefully, I think the tour are trying to do that, you know, so fingers crossed it stays that way. It's interesting you say that because I, I watched quite a bit of golf actually yesterday, funnily enough. And it, what you're saying there, man, is the two, uh, the courses yesterday on the PGA Tour and the European Tour couldn't have been further apart. Because the course no. in Belgium just looked brilliant. Uh, 12 under par or whatever won it. Firm greens, irons off yeah. the tees. And that thing in America, I mean, McElroy said, oh, a few years ago, didn't he? The European tour play courses where the scoring's so low, it's ridiculous. I mean, that That's thing that. in America last week just looked a joke for pros. It's awful. I, you know, I just didn't want to watch it. It was just no. pathetic, wasn't it? And then you look at the course in Belgium. I, I played it a couple of years ago, Rinkman, I think it was called or whatever. But what a golf course, really tight, firm, um, had to hit the fairway. Otherwise, you just didn't have the control from the, the, the wispy rough, you know. And um, I think that's the way golf courses should be. And uh, it's just much more exciting to watch, I think, you know. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, like Hilverstrom in Holland and places like that, they people awesome. say, oh, the courses aren't long enough. Or you take a Sunningdale Old, for example, and you get oh, the greens and the really, fairways yeah. really firm. I still yeah, think yeah. there's a, a place. And then one or two of the players, McElroy and people said, oh, well, I can't, you know, they come out and say, I can't hit my drive on these courses. Well, I don't know. I mean, I just think, I totally agree with what you're saying, Manners. And it's, uh, I, I think, you know, the, these courses, I say that course in Belgium, I've never played it. It just looked brilliant yesterday. Yeah, mate, great course. Uh, I think they got 36 holes in. The very, yeah, two courses are very similar. You know, you just go around the world at the great events. I think like Hong Kong, Fang Ling Golf got really tight, fiddly, your Valderramas, PJ Catalunas. They're just, they're not long courses, but what great golf courses they are to play as well, you know? Mm. I, I thought you might mention Hong Kong, because that's uh, something we might get into a bit later. 
but anyway there you go so but yeah it's, it's interesting you say so just summing up you your guys relationship you'd say um neil that you kind of work on the same things really so it seems like the way the game has um gone forward you guys have moved forward trying to create a bit more speed and trying to get him to do a little bit further really well it's it yeah for sure because some of those golf courses like like you both said it it's whether you know, it's great if the tour are trying to move it in that direction a little bit uh, uh, or have a few of those events which are more skillful, tighter, fiddly, firmer greens, difficult pin positions. Well, well that's fantastic. But unfortunately, some of them, are, though the trend has been that it needs to be sopping wet. It needs to be really long. And and unfortunately, then, you know, you can play certain golf courses, can't you, Stu, where the, the, if you full toss it 300 and odd yards, like it's as wide as you like. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It 70 off the tee and you're right in the neck where all the traps are. Well, you can yeah. imagine not only the fact that you're hitting a, a five iron or four iron in versus a, a nine iron, but you you've also can take the trouble out. Mm. So, yeah, you know, if the game moves a little bit in that way, then then you need to adapt and you need to move a little bit in that way. And um, I totally get what you're saying. It's interesting, isn't it? Like everybody back uh, 25 years ago was talking about talk about uh, consistency, being really super consistent, making cuts, so on and so forth. And and now people are saying the last thing you want to be is consistent. What you want to be is is when you're on, you want to be great. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting. So so just moving on before we finish with with Wales. So just give a give us a brief uh, kind of outline, Neil, of what what uh, what your job actually entails. Is it all the way from grassroots all the way through to the elite Welsh amateurs? No, no not really. No, um, and it has changed over time. So I'm I'm now the sort of head of coaching. So I kind of. Uh, which is, in essence, um, a role that I'd, I'd done for a, for a while, really, where um, I, I kind of worked hand in hand with a performance director to help to, to put programs and plans in place for our international teams. Generally, I look after the men's international team or the under 18 really? international teams uh, on the on the boys' side, um, but have been responsible in the past for even coaching our entry level, which was a nursery squad uh, of sort of. 10 handicap, as you know, a, a while back, we thought, right, we've got a, a lull of players. So we we took 10, 10 players, some girls, some boys, and and decided to coach them um, all the way up through our system. And, uh, you know, probably I think eight or nine of them had, had played international golf from the age of 10 and and a few, uh, three or four uh, GB&I representation, which was which was really good. So I, I initially started coaching that squad and and then they got passed through our academy and regional program until they they then re-emerged back in our national squads. Okay. So just, just going back as well to one name that was uh, mentioned earlier, because on the podcast we've done, you know, we do like to do some serious name dropping for this situation. So we've had Paul Way talking about his Seve, uh, playing with Seve, et cetera. So we, we'd say we've done a lot of serious name dropping. As in name dropping in Wales, Phil Price, so Price is a good friend, long-term friend of mine, his strengths, uh, Neil, were totally... Would he have been the same golfer in this uh, day and age? Would he have achieved the same, do you believe, as he has achieved? Oh, that's a hell of a question. Difficult to answer, isn't it? Because some of the... Like, it's certainly less suited to his style of play now, isn't it, than, than ever before. But, you know, it's funny because you... Um, when I look at Phil, like, not only... You know, can the guy putt, and he's probably as good as anybody inside of a hundred yards at his at his best. But uh, he just had an ability to 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 get it in the house in a low score, regardless of how he was he was hitting it. And and he was gritty, wasn't he? If he could produce results, and and you know, fit play, he was. You know, he played Ryder Cup. He was excellent as one a number of times. So and now is is doing well on the seniors tour, but at the end of his career, as naturally happens, you know, at 47, 48, after playing on tour for, I don't know how long he played on, 25 years maybe was he, he was near enough. But those courses um, uh, became very difficult. We, we, I remember going and coaching up in Wentworth and he, he had a good result there, but, uh, you know, it was head covers coming off everywhere on the front nine and and he shot 68. He's, and I remember us chatting afterwards. I said, Phil, it's one of the finest rounds of golf I've ever seen. Because he physically could not have scored any lower than that score. Um, you know, he's chipped in once. He's holding everything. He's hitting. He's missed. He, well, he couldn't reach the third in, in 
sort of two hits and then stiffed it from 50 yards. Like it was a fantastic scoring round of golf. But obviously, I, I think McElroy at eight iron into the third that day. Mm. Like that's that becomes very hard. And um, as Phil would say, you know, he he noticed it that when he went out on tour originally, he would have been above average length. And then as the generations kept coming and he was out seeing quite a few, uh, it become harder, didn't it? Because they they do they just they they come out there and and hit it so far and then you know you're gonna have a handful of them that they're on each week, uh, and to shoot twenty under par around a seven and a half thousand yard golf course is difficult. Yeah, I mean he, he's a he's a I'd say I've played a lot of golf with him over the years. He's about my age and that, and he you know I wouldn't say he's an overachiever, but he's had a great career. He really has. I mean it'd be. And obviously everybody will remember him for holding that putt down the 16th up and down and over the tier and uh, taking down big Phil. We'll move on to him in a minute as well. <laughs> so, so Manners, just moving on to you. I, I was just going to ask you kind of like uh, talking about memorable occasions. You'd have to say Phil's most memorable occasion will be holding that putt on the uh, 16th at, at the Belfry. You, you've had a couple of, I would say memorable occasions as well outside of the challenge tour. I, I take you on to uh, the world cup because you played in three world cups for Wales, haven't you? But obviously the, the one that I remember and a lot of people remember is the famous, uh, the one eleven. Yeah. Good luck in the life story. Yeah. That was obviously my first world cup as well. Um, just talk, just talk us through, just give us a bit of a, the year of it, the course, and there was a big shiny silver Mercedes on the tee. So you get there and just give us a, just a, just a brief kind of what happened. Because obviously was, for, for, the fan, I, for the fans of Stuart Manley, it was the middle of the night, so we were asleep, but you were kind of stroking that big silver Mercedes. Well, no, I get there at the start of the week and my playing partner, Welsh playing partner, didn't turn up, which was nice. So... Um, so automatically we were out to the team event. So I was just playing in the individual. Um, but luckily for me, I, I played well, obviously, in that individual. Um, finished at eighth, I think, overall. But um, it was on the third round where I started birdie birdie. And then I got onto the third hole. Really great little par three. Very tricky. Pin was right at the front. It was downwind over a ravine and one bounced it into the hole. And um, I had like one of my best mates on the bag and we were high-fiving, high-fiving the crowd. And then like, you know, I've gone back, as you know, I've gone back to the car, I've struck the car, I've almost sat on the car and just thought, wow. The I'm car, driving the, basically, the... mate, the car was yours, wasn't it? It was mine, mate. I, yeah, I don't that's mind. what we want to know. <laughs> I, I already had it outside my house, mate, in my head. <laughs> um, and then only to get up to the green for John Parry, uh, John Parry Moore to say... Um, Stu, let me just read your head and find out, you know, everything's good with the car. I was like, all right, John, no problem. Uh, so as I was walking off the green, he was like, oh, Stu, um, really, really sorry, mate. But um, it was only for Sunday only. And obviously this was a Saturday. I thought at first he was winding me up um, because obviously it's a WGC event, World Cup. And you're thinking, no, it's got to be any day, surely, for such a prestigious event. But no, he wasn't uh, wasn't winding me up. And then uh, obviously I had to make my way to the next tee. Head was proper in the shed and just didn't know where I was. And ended up making uh, a catastrophe uh, going uh, on the scorecard. A one on number three and then uh, two ones next to it on hole number four for an 11. So, uh, but all I remember as well is like when I got up to the green on that fourth hole, I kept chipping up this bank and then the ball kept rolling into my feet and the Aussie crowd, they're quite brutal, as you know, from the like, Aussie sport from the cricket they were just giving me so much abuse from like you know so I just could not wait to just get off that call uh, that hall and just literally ah uh, crawl into a hall I felt so bad um not just to make obviously losing the car but then just to make the 11 straight after it oh, it's just a disaster I, I've got to say it's one of those things that I will remember because I, I kind of for some reason that I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought I'll just have a look at the uh the live scoring, see how it's going. And I looked and I saw one and then I saw 11. And I thought that just cannot be right. That must be some Aussie well, who's had too, yeah. many, too many tins of lager doing the scoring and he's yeah. just got ones written everywhere. Yeah, that's what you would think. If you were looking out for a friend or a player of yours and you just look at it, you think, oh, well, that's just a mistake, isn't it? You know, there's yeah. no way that 
happened. Yeah, I say I, I uh, just thought I just thought it was the Aussie scorer having too many tins of lager. I, I just couldn't believe it. But I mean, fair play to you. Moving on, I, I think you, you shot about 74, 75 that round. No, I shot 70, I shot 72 actually. 72 even better. And yeah, then I had finish- a couple of birdies and an eagle late in the round, and ended up having a decent Sunday as well, and finishing obviously eighth, um, yeah, yeah. which was which was amazing for me financially as well. But <clears> I think even now that was still my still my highest paycheck ever, mm. um, so which which was awesome at the time, you know, and really kind of give me a big boost. Um, and I literally, I think I went from there. And I think I'm sure Hong Kong was the week after. And I ended up obviously, as you know, losing in the playoff to Jimenez. Um, so it was a great couple of weeks actually. Just, just moving on from that, from that after you got a, you know, you, you made eleven, whatever, on that, that next hole. What was it kind of? Obviously, your mental state wasn't the greatest at the time. But how did you actually get over that within the same rounds, as you say, to go and get an eagle later on, shoot seventy two? I mean, it's a fair effort. That is. I just, I just thought, right, you know, knuckle down. We were playing for so much money, Jeremy. You know what I mean? It was, it was like a seven, eight million events, and I hadn't played in many of those events. And I just thought. You know, you still got a chance. I was actually playing well, obviously, because after the start, I went birdie, birdie, eagle. I was actually third in the tournament. Um, and I just knew what was up for stake. It was a lot of prize money. So I thought, all right, come on, get your head down here and um, grind it out, you know. Um, yeah, it was awesome, to be fair. Um, I, I almost felt like I turned the crowd a little bit towards the end. Like I was getting geared, obviously, after the 11. But by the end, I think people really appreciated what I'd kind of done, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, rightly so as well. The score, the score you did after what had happened because it's it's not every every day someone goes one, thinks they've won a car, and then makes an eleven on the next hole. I mean, mentally, like you were saying earlier in the in the in the show, Neil, about whether um, Manners could finish things off. But that's a fair effort mentally to go and do that, isn't it? Oh, incredible! You know, fair play and. Um... Like that, that, that's one of your, your skills, Stu, isn't it? You're gritty, you never ever give in, and you'd no. always be fighting to, to the very end. And, um, like, like you said, you've just it's in that moment without question is shell shocking, but you've got a choice to make then as a player of new. You, it, it, it's, um, you know, how you manage yourself and uh, how you then golf your ball from there on inwards is a, is a very difficult choice, but it's a choice. And he, you know, that was outstanding. And then not only did that, but backed it up with a with a fantastic final round, which was great. Yeah, I mean, because like, you, like you were saying, man, if you, fair enough, you're playing for a lot of money and, and money and golf is a topic of conversation at the moment. But even so, you're playing for pride as well and, and trying to do the best you can. And, you know, you go one and 11. I mean, if I'd done that, my head would have been all over the place. I mean, I say, I just think it's a, a fair effort the way you kind of calm, must have calmed yourself down a bit. And God knows what you must have been thinking when you were standing on the next tee and just made an 11. Yeah, obviously I was pretty shell-shocked. And I do yeah. fear my, my caddy at the time was like, right, come on, man, if you can get this back. And I was like, I just didn't want to hear it. You know, it's like, all right, okay. <laughs> but um, the worst thing, like the worst thing was as well now to this very day, every week, say so I played a pro-am on a challenge tour <laughs> and I, the pro-am partners every week bring it up. Everyone brings it up nearly every week. They must Google and obviously it comes up. Yeah. So I'm t- telling man. this story every, every week. Yeah, every week to these guys. And I was like, oh, just guys, like, give me a break. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So mo- mo- <clears throat> we'll give you a break. Moving on from that one then. So you say yeah. Hong Kong. Well, I remember that one well as well. Coming down the last hole, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, the chipping in against Jimenez, uh, to, to make the playoff. I mean, what, what, what a great thing that was as well. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, that was one of the best feelings as well. Obviously, um, I'd hit it down the middle on, it was a 70 second hole. I was in the last group because I was leading after three rounds and I think Jimenez had posted a good score from a couple of groups before me. Um, and obviously, Fangling, I don't, you'll, you'll know it. Obviously, it's a very tough hole, very tough finishing hole. The, the, the tough, the, the tee shot's very tight, but then the second shot is a really tough, tough approach to a tough green, um, which greens were very firm. So I've hit it down the middle, and then I've hit a great six iron straight at the pin. Um, but unfortunately, it's come up like a couple of yards short onto the the bank of the green and has rolled back down into a bit of a tricky lie. But it's one of those if you kind of get right, you can just pop it on and give yourself a good chance. It was an uphill chip and um, you don't really expect to hold it, but it was 
was one of those I thought to myself, oh, if I get this right, you've got a chance. You know what I mean? And as soon as I hit it, you, you've probably seen the videos or whatever. As soon as I've hit it, I think it's got my attention immediately. And it's, it's literally tracked as soon as it's hit the green. I, I kind of, I've gone away to my caddy almost before it's gone in and given it a high five and given him a, a big fist pump, you know, but um, yeah, that was an awesome feeling. It, it was tough though. I was on such a high. The adrenaline was pumping like, you know, no other straight after that um, that shot. I literally had to sign my card like so quickly because we were losing light uh, in, in Hong Kong. There wasn't much light uh, left. And then I was literally buggied straight back to the 18th tee. And I was still almost shaking from holding that shot. And uh, I just wish now, if, like, obviously, if I'd had a bit more experience, obviously, I was quite young then. If a bit more experience it would have been great, kind of just to take a few deep breaths and say, say to myself, like, you know, just calm down here. Like, this just get you know gather your thoughts and then kind of play the playoff a little bit better maybe you know yeah i was going to say because mentally it was a totally different thing to the australian situation where 111 you're on such a low obviously chipping yeah. in in the, on the 72nd hole i remember it well watching it and they're on, you're on such a high it's, it's a totally different thing altogether isn't it but it's part of a thing just going back to the coaching neil that you know, it's a great example, probably, that you could, it's not for me to tell you what to do, but it'd be, it's a great example for you to tell your, some of your young guys playing for, you know, in the under-18s and whatever, you know, the difference of the highs and lows in golf. Oh, without, without a shadow of a doubt. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really difficult game, isn't it? It's a difficult game that you, you know, if you were a boxer, you'd hate it, wouldn't you? How often we lose in reality compared to how often we, we play. Um you know, every every shot you you might say you're trying to hold the thing, and how often do we actually do it? So, it, it is almost a game of um, it's not a game of being perfect, is it? And it is um, it's challenging, and you will have tough times in a career. You will have good times, but you know when Stu has come or Phil have come and spoken to the squad, there's such value in that because people can almost even if you haven't done it, you can still relate to it, can't you? And then whether you're playing at an amateur level or you're playing at a, a professional level, you you can you can learn from those experiences. But unfortunately you don't learn that on a driving range. Mm. You know, you, you you learn that and become hardened through competitive golf and through those those experiences. And as man as I said, if if it were to happen again, it doesn't make it much easier, but you still you at least you can draw down on some of those experiences and learn how to to handle yourself like you know when he won a playoff in um where was it manners in france was it um uh, yeah Santa that, that that undoubtedly would have um, that first experience against jimenez would have helped with that mm. so yeah we, we just moving back a little bit you know we were talking about the coaching and when people are younger and psychologists and nutritionists going back to the walker cup actually man as it's something there i'll talk about nutritionists i remember the guy said to us you know probably best if you don't have one of the sausage sandwiches after 10 holes at Sunningdale. You know, you can hardly resist them at Sunningdale. They're the best in the world, but there you go. But the, the whole coaching of, of the young guys, Neil, it's just to finish on the coaching side of it. You know, there's psychologists, there's nutritionists, there's strength coaches, there's you as a performance coach and a technical coach. There's a, there's a lot for these young people to take on board. And it seems like... Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. It's 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 an easy thing for them to get too much information too young. Do you think? Oh, without without question, I think you've um, like it goes for all of us, doesn't it? it? Doesn't really matter how young you are. You you what you really need to do is figure out what's the priority, and you need to deliver on that. And uh, and there's often with every player's game, there's low hanging fruit, and you'd be wise to, to to look at the areas you can you can change easily and maintain those rather than one of the biggest mistakes we can often do is you go after trying to change or do everything and often you'll achieve nothing and and you start to start to struggle because there is only so much capacity for what we can we can choose to focus on and i think it's just vital that these things do not have to be done overnight they can they you know when certainly when they come into a national squad they might not turn pro for 10 years well you know this that, that unfortunately experience says you know you need to sometimes take time and uh, to build these skills slowly rather than gradually and then how that information is filtered to the players i think is absolutely crucial and needs to be based on on a priority of what does that player need to do to play play the game better mm. because it was interesting a couple of the other people have been on a couple of the other guys players and coaches have said you know they feel it's important when these kids are 
11, 12, 13, or a bit younger than that, maybe, you know, golf shouldn't be the only sport they play. You know, it, it, you can't obsess it. The Tiger Woods, obviously, is an example, and the Williams sisters in tennis. But there's many more who've fallen by the wayside, who've been not driven, but pushed to just do one sport. I'm talking about golf now, and you've probably seen it. And, uh, it, you know, it doesn't do anybody any harm playing a bit of rugby or a bit of tennis or a bit of other sports when they're like 11 and 12. I totally agree with you. I think, look... It, you don't play world class sport at usually twice, do you? You know, it it's one of those things that you'll have to specialize at some point. Yeah. I think the grounding of a young person, A, you know, why eh, like a lot has talked about professional sport, but you should come into initially for the love of the sport and to enjoy playing sport. And then it does give you a lot of different factors. And I know what you, you mean, like some of the it's hard, isn't it, to actually parent somebody that is going to be a really good player. Uh, because there's not, not very few courses that you can go on for parenting. Uh, a, a, an elite sports person, you may or may not have ever dealt with that before. And, and some people do it amazingly. And some people perhaps need to look at, at how, how they deal with that because it's, it's, it's difficult. And there's probably no one size fits all. But I, I, I'm a strong believer in that. You know, you need to have a life and you need to, um, you need to have a release from a sport. And, but you also have in the ability to even other sports, like you said there, where you're working as a team. Because at some point, even golf, though it's an individual sport, you know, Stu has got a team around him. You know, even just all of us here that work with him, he's got to learn to work with, with us. And I think that um, playing those other sports, that it gives you so many other, you know, even just being competitive, isn't it? Like in certain sports is really useful. Mm. But that, that's the other good thing about why I think the, the people who are the kids like Stu, you did it, I did it years ago, went to university in America, Booty did it, you know, and I think it get, gives gets people a bit more rounded. I mean, my son, who you both know, he went to university in America and, it, you know, it's to do with time management, going away from home, getting used to traveling and really looking after yourself and becoming more independent. So if and when you do get on the tour or you start playing professional golf, you can look after yourself where I feel that some of the younger players, I don't know so much about the Welsh golf union, but I've seen out, you know, others within England and I've spoken to some of them over the years. They seem just because they play for England and they've been mollycoddled in a way that they, they expect this, expect that and everything else. But the ones that come back from America they they seem rounded and ready to go. Yeah, I guess it doesn't it doesn't fit everybody, but I think it is also a wonderful experience. And yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, it, it, you learn to deal with some of the failures, don't you? And things go wrong, and you have uh, those bumps along the way, and you've got to learn to manage that. And I think when it's, it's a funny topic, but when coaches or parents or everybody, uh, you you basically try to get rid of the bumps and you try to make sure that everything's too perfect whether that be in practice or whether it be in doing everything for them. Well, look, um, as far as I'm aware, you know, I can't hit the ball for steel, thank God. You know, he's got to hit it himself. He's got to make his own choices and he's got to commit to those choices. He's got to learn from them. And, and sometimes he makes some really good choices. Sometimes he doesn't. And you, you'll have tough weeks on the road and he'll have, and he'll have good weeks on the road. And, and those skills, um, I don't think you learn them if you, if you try to to take all of those decisions out of the player's choice, and you you make things too almost too too neat and too perfect, mm, so I would think, how are you going to learn? And um, you know, like I do, we, we play a game, a game of failure, don't we? Basically, you fail a lot, and you you've got to be okay with that, and you've got to understand how hard the game is, and uh, you still got to come back loving it and wanting a bit more. Mm. I mean, from a player's point of view, Stu, it's, it's absolutely true what Neil's just said. I mean. Golf is a game where you lose, obviously, a lot more than you win. Tiger Woods is a bit different, but for most mortals like us, you know, you, you constantly, you're not losing, but you've got to learn to find a, find a positive out of everything you do when you're playing golf. But to me, that was always a thing that I, I struggle with sometimes is, you know, you go and have a, a reasonable tournament where you finish, make the cut on the mark or something, and people said, oh, take the positives out of it. Sometimes I struggle to do that, and I think it's so important that people can do that. Yeah, definitely. And like Neil said, like there's, uh, there's probably a lot more failure um, in tournament golf, professional golf. Um, you can, uh, you'll, you'll play 25, 30 events, and you'll miss a lot of cuts in that potentially um, without um, only having maybe one or two big weeks 
Um, I think a lot of times for me, when I did lose my card, I was like, right, am I still improving? Am I getting, am I growing as a golfer here? Am I getting better? And I think like every year, although, okay, I lost my card, I felt like, right, actually I did get better that time. You know, that year I, I improved this area. My stroke average was better. I felt technically, so that, that, that kind of just, spur me on almost for that like a, a hard winter then to get back out get the card straight back or whatever I did um but I always looked at it like that you know you're gonna have lots of failures but I thought at the end of the year if you analyze it, you think right did you improve this year did you do you know did you do the best you could if you know if you did then I thought well okay that was a that was a promising year mm, so looking back I mean not that you're coming to the end but you're 43 you're a bit older than some of them on the tour um, would you have done anything different in the last 15 years or, or during the times you guys have both worked together? It's a question to both of you, really. Looking back at it, would, would you have done anything different in, first of all, Neil, and what you've kind of said or tried to get the direction you've taken, Stu, or is it kind of like, well, obviously it's a team effort, uh, talking about teams, but would you guys have done anything different, do you think? Um. Oh, I'm, I'm sure, like, like I guess, springing to mind now, I would have definitely, I probably would have gone out on tour, watched him compete a little bit more um, because as a player, it's really difficult, isn't it? So how, how you, what you think is happening and what is actually happening might not always be the, the case. And, you know, when, when I watch some of the amateurs play, even our best amateurs who have played Walker Cup players, you can sometimes look at what, how they review around golf and how you think around the golf or having watched it can be two very different things so i probably would have got out there on the golf course and, and watched him more at at tournaments not just um not just seeing him in that sort of environment uh, because that probably would have uh, like i definitely think when when he played really well through uh, hong kong and royal melbourne it was interesting you were definitely thinking way differently man as when you and mm. and and focused on um, on winning ultimately on 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 going out there with the intent of being great. Whereas I think for the first couple of years that we worked together, um, whilst he was developing his game and his game has improved immeasurably, really in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know whether he was going out there and to going out there to win, or whether he was gravitating more towards the the cut line. You know. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Neil. that's probably one thing, Jeremy. I would have probably tried to alter going back in time I would have tried to have thought a lot more positive um like obviously when I got on tour I was like a little bit starstruck kind of uh, you know these are some big names here can I compete with them I probably deep down thought that I didn't it's only like probably only the last decade that I thought actually yeah I could beat these guys obviously it comes with results granted but it took me a while to realize yeah I, you know I can compete with these guys and probably the other thing, Jeremy, is maybe I probably would have liked to throw myself into like a um, more of a strength conditioning uh, throughout my career. I would have liked to have got stronger. I think uh, I think that would have potentially helped, especially now maybe later in my career. Um, I you know I dabbled with it bits and pieces, but I never kept it throughout the season and never made it my life in some sense. You know, I was too almost wrapped up in playing and um, not doing that. I think mm. so. Just finishing off on the on the sorry, on the Welsh golf here, and so the, the future Welsh golf Neil is looking pretty bright. Some good young kids, and things are set up well for the future. Yeah, I I, I certainly hope so. You know, look, as a small country, we um, you know, we you it, you know, you have it in cycles. You know, I, I know every country have it in cycles, but the smaller the country, you certainly do so. And and we'd had a number of players like your David Boot that you mentioned and Jack Davidson that uh, you know had, had been in one of my sort of younger national squads even sort of ollie far really and it was it's been great to see some of those guys coming through and and it was great to kind of go on a journey with um you know certainly jack and dave where they they progressed from being 15 in a squad to becoming walker cup players and then and then turning professional and we got a number of good players you know james ashfield was in the semi-final of the the british amateur last year um We've got a couple of players in the States that have been doing really well. Archie Davis just got named in the Palmer Cup team. So as well as some some really good girl players as well um, on the female side. So, you know, your fingers crossed, you know, we just um, 
we just keep doing as best uh, we possibly can and uh, be exciting this year with the Eisenhower Trophy coming up, a three-man team and uh, look forward to, to to that, even though the test will be pretty tough at the Golf National, but we'll it'll be, it'll be great to kind of get out there and compete again after two years of really not being able to, to do a huge amount on the amateur team level, you know? That was the other point I was going to just quickly make. I mean, the last two years obviously been difficult. You mentioned likes of Jack and, and David Boot and that, and with COVID and less com- less competition, some guys have come out of that in a better way who maybe got their card after the 2019 season, and some guys with no uh, tour scores have come out of it in a worse way. It's been, some have, you know, benefited or not benefited, but in a way benefited with playing opportunities from COVID, and some of them have, uh, it's been hard for them. Yeah, it's been a difficult time for everybody, really, and just odd, isn't it? It's been an odd sort of uh, odd sort of time, and and like you said, like um, if you've well, it's, certain categories on tour have had an amazing time, haven't they? Uh, that's what I'm had saying. A, yeah, almost yeah. had a free run, and what a what an opportunity to learn and to experience without feeling like you were going to lose much. Um, <laughs> whereas other people have been, you know, the Euro Pro Tour got kind of canned, didn't it? And Q School's been yeah, been yeah. A little, you know, like how hard has that been for some players? Yeah, yeah. So- well, oh, different likes of Jack and them guys who are just turned pro. Yeah, they just have not, not had the opportunity have they, to progress up the ladder onto the tours and stuff. So you got to feel for them. Like obviously myself, I lose my card in the end of nineteen was couldn't have been a worse time really if I obviously <laughs> kept it. Here, um, I would have had several more years free, uh, free goes at it. You know. Yeah. So you know, some have benefited like like a lot of things in life. Some have benefited, and some people have uh, you know been on the wrong side of it. So. That's unfortunate. But just before we finish, so obviously the, the news at the moment within professional golf this week, we've got the USPGA coming up. But, but this podcast is going to go out on the night before of an Asian tour event at Slaley Hall, which obviously is a unique thing. But Manus, you, you know, we've uh, you're lucky enough, not lucky enough, but you've got an invite to it. And today you found out you've been given the release for from the European Tour, which has been a topic of conversation on who's getting releases and who isn't, especially for Centurion the week after. Just to both of you, what is your views? I'm not talking about the political views of Saudi Arabia. I'm talking more about the, the views of is there room in golf for more tours and is there room in golf for what could be billions of dollars? Yeah, I don't. I don't see why not, mate. I think there is more room. Um, give the players more opportunity. Give the players more opportunity to go play where they want to. Um, I'm all for that. But obviously, you got to be careful. Obviously, the tours have got to be. They've got to look after themselves. Obviously, the PJ Tour is obviously in a much better place. That's very strong. Um, they obviously don't want change. The DP Tour uh, will don't want change. Um, but it's yeah, it's a tricky one. Personally, I would like to obviously try my chances um obviously i've got that invite for slaley hall which i'm really grateful for and grateful for the the dp tour to give me the release which uh which came a couple of hours ago which as you know but um yeah really excited to play in that and it'll be interesting to see how many guys do play in it and the week after in centurion but don't you think if the question was flipped around as we spoke about beforehand we didn't go into this too much because the the result is you have got a release if you hadn't had a release uh, you would have felt not bitter about it, but I mean, I think it would have been a bit sad, really, from your point of view, but just generally for golf, if they're stopping people playing in certain places. I know the European Tour have got an event in uh, in Germany, but there's no stopping the Asian Tour having an event in England. I know it's a bit strange, but, you know, I, I think it would have been disappointing if they hadn't given you a release. Yeah, yeah. Um... Like I've got no, you know, no problem with the Asian Tour being over in Europe and in the UK. On a personal um, side of things, obviously I'm not getting into the European the DP Tour um, event that week in Germany. So common sense has prevailed. I think obviously I, we looked today who we were 60th reserve or whatever it was for the Porsche. So um, to release me, yeah, that, that's great. It's just common sense. I'm not playing, so why not let me play? Mm. But so basically, do you think this uh, <clears throat> Greg Norman's obviously adamant and he's got all this money behind him, the PJ Tour of, of run professional golf for the last 30 years? To me, it seems a little bit like the PGA Tour, the European Tour, or now with the PGA Tour, the PJ Tour have run professional golf for a long time. And somebody with a lot of money has come along and they're upsetting the apple cart in a way 
and that's the point I'm really asking to you, Manners, as a player more. Do you think there's room where this can, you know, everybody can get get together and make it work? Yeah, I do think there's room. Obviously, it's a, it's a massive game worldwide. There's so it's a huge market. Um, I definitely think there is room for the Saudi um, golf leagues, etc. Um, it's good, healthy competition. Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, to me, the, the the benefit of all that millions and billions of dollars that could come into the game could could go down to the lower levels, Neil, almost into the like Welsh tournaments, etc. And that I know they want everybody wants the top fifty players in the world. In an ideal world, that's what the PGA Tour would have, the European Tour. Every tournament would just be the top fifty. But if all that money comes into the game, it, it could filter down to the smaller tours even like the euro pro etc if done properly I, I can't work out or i can't understand more why these people can't get together and kind of think right let's do it for the good of the game and for welsh golf and all the other countries there's so many more people trying to make a living at golf now because golf has become such a big global sport it's different from when i started there weren't so many people trying yeah, I guess, I guess it's difficult without knowing the ins and outs of what, what is going on, which you two probably would know more than, than myself. I think um, if if it can be done in a way where, you know, like you said, everybody can get together and it can it can be fed into the game of golf and it can make the game of golf more accessible for for more players, um, more more um, the more money being fed all the way through the game. Well, I think that that's that's fantastic, and uh, and it is difficult, isn't it? Because like in in Stewart's sort of um, defense, like I think if you're not getting into uh, the current tour events, like it, that totally makes sense to me with him him being released to to play that event. Um, but yeah, it'd be it'd be interesting to see, wasn't it? It'd be yeah. See where well, it where it where does it go from here? And um, and and ultimately, a lot of the golfers just want to play, don't they? Yeah. Just want to play. Just want to play play the game of golf, and um, um, yeah, you know, it'll be interesting to see where it where it goes from here. Yeah, and from oh, I don't know where Manners has gone. He's still there, maybe. But from your point of view, um, Neil, you obviously wanted to finish in the top three at Slaley. That'd be a nice commission on the prize fund there, and then he can move on to Century and then win four million dollars there, and then uh, we'll all be happy. I think we'd all be pretty happy with yeah, that. Yeah, we would. We'd be all <laughs> having be a very... party. Matt. Trust me, we not sure. I'm not sure that's in our contract, Neil. The, uh, I think it was European <laughs> and uh, or events. Only, but yeah, we, we, we'll have to chat about it. Yeah, I look I look forward to coming back on the podcast after that, Jeremy. Hey, Neil, don't worry about it. I've already sorted out with him. <laughs> if he gets there, we've had this discussion. <laughs> and he can go on about as many contracts as he wants, but he knows where we stand. Yeah, anyway, sure. just, just to finish off, first of all... Uh, Thanks a lot for coming on. It's been, it's been a lot of fun and been interesting as well. But I've got a couple of quick fire questions. Manners, favourite course in the world? Uh, Hong Kong, Fangin. Well, there you go. If you chip in on the last, it's got to be, isn't it? Yeah, that's a great course. Uh, you know, it's obviously it's tough to pick one. I, I love Valderrama, um, Leopard Creek. The Aussie ones are great. Yeah. Neil, favourite course, mate? I quite like Royal Birkdale. Ooh. Very nice. Very Not on that Thursday morning at 6.30, though. <laughs> well, it's okay when you're watching. <laughs> he, enjoyed the play, he enjoyed the players' lounge, I know that. Yeah, he did. He enjoyed, he enjoyed the food and all those yardage books. Love a yardage book. 15 Love a coffee. Yardage. And then the last question, with talking about the Open, the last question, hopefully you'll be there, Manners, but the last one, 150th Open coming up at St Andrews. It's going to be an amazing event, I'm sure. Uh, your tip to win the 150th Open Championship? Well, it's got to be myself, hasn't it, mate? Outside of yourself. Me and... Oh, OK, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, let me think. Um, Brooks Kopka. Oof. There's one for you. Neil? Mm. I think... Would I go Scheffler or would I go... Uh... Rory. I'm going to go Rory. Rory. Okay. Go there we it. go. Brooks Kepra, Rory. I'm going with Tiger. So there you go. No. Come oh, on. Yeah. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Well, everybody would, wouldn't they? Yeah. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. It'd be fantastic. So I'd love to see Manners beat him in a playoff. <clears throat> that would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hey, make, sure hey, make sure you get a bit of commission out of that, Neil, won't you? Just get the yardage book for you, Stu, if you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, boys. 
It's been a pleasure. Oh. Thanks very much. Sleep well. Sleep well, and thanks for coming on. Hey, boys. Take All care. All right, cheers. Thanks.